Hello, I'm Admiral Thad Allen, the 23rd Commandant of the United States Coast Guard. The United States Coast Guard is America's smallest armed service, yet each and every day the Coast Guard accomplishes an extraordinary range of missions. Over the course of our history, we have acted as a beacon for mariners in distress, secured our maritime borders against pirates, smugglers, invaders, and terrorists, and fought in every overseas conflict from the quasi-war with France in 1797 to Operation Iraqi Freedom today. Recently, millions of Americans watched with pride as the men and women of the Coast Guard lifted thousands of our fellow citizens to safety after Hurricane Katrina. What you are about to see is a celebration of still another vital mission of the Coast Guard, scientific research and military preparedness at the ends of the earth. In 1957, three Coast Guard cutters, the buoy tenders Bramble and Spar, and the icebreaker Storis became the first American ships to navigate the historic Northwest Passage as they helped complete a series of radar stations vital to the nation's security during the Cold War. Like their counterparts in today's Coast Guard, these pioneers lived in a world of dynamic threats and hazards. And like the Coast Guard men and women of today, they met these challenges through a unique combination of competence, capability, and courage. Now join me as we remember and celebrate one of the many large accomplishments of a small but proud service, your United States Coast Guard. It is a part of the world that is both beautiful and inhospitable, sunless and frigid in winter, barely thawing in summer, sheathed in impenetrable ice most of the year. Yet here lies what European kings and merchants dreamed of since the Middle Ages. What explorers like Christopher Columbus, John Cabot, Hernan Cortez, and Henry Hudson sought but failed to find. And what scores of others died trying to explore. This is the land of the Northwest Passage, the fabled deep water sea route across the top of North America. Even for today's powerful vessels equipped with 21st century navigation technology, these are among the most treacherous shipping lanes in the world. For the three U.S. Coast Guard cutters and their crews, who 50 years ago were assigned to chart the first of these channels, the Northwest Passage was, as it had been for centuries, still an unconquered challenge. Yet their mission aimed at much more than achieving an historic first. It aimed at achieving an historic first that was critical to America's national defense. Five hundred years ago, when Europeans realized that the New World was not fabulously wealthy Asia, but instead two enormous obstacles blocking the path to Asia, attention turned to finding a way past those obstacles. With Spain and Portugal claiming the southern territories and controlling the route around Cape Horn, Europe's other military and commercial powers, England, Netherlands, and France, were forced to search for a sea route to the north, the Northwest Passage. For more than a century, explorers famous and not so famous searched in vain. Faced with savage cold and relentless ice, many turned back or found themselves trapped in the ice for months at a time or worse. When Henry Hudson's second expedition found itself threatened by encroaching ice, the crew mutinied and set the explorer adrift in a small boat with his young son and seven loyal crew members, never to be seen again. Five years later, the navigator and explorer, William Baffin, sailed hundreds of miles farther north than any of his predecessors and still found no sign of a route to the Pacific. Hopes of ever finding the Northwest Passage faded. 200 years passed before the search resumed, only to see one mission after another fail. Most tragic was an expedition commanded by British Captain John Franklin. Almost midway through the passage, his two ships became hopelessly trapped in late summer ice and remained trapped for 18 months. Franklin died, and what remained of the 129 officers and crew finally set out on foot, marching south. None survived. It was another 60 years before a Norwegian explorer, Roald Amundsen, piloting a shallow draft 65-foot herring sloop, successfully navigated a route through the Canadian archipelago. The voyage took three years, 
And though it proved that a transit of polar waters was possible, its route over shoals and shallows and through narrow channels was impractical for commercial vessels. Forty years later, a second vessel, the Royal Mounted Canadian Police Schooner St. Roche, made a successful transit, but its route too was unsuitable for deep draft vessels. To this point, no U.S. ship had attempted a full transit of the passage, and with good reason. There was little commercial incentive to risk vessels and lives, since the United States had ports on both coasts and full access to the Panama Canal. But with the 1950s came the Cold War and the possibility of Soviet airstrikes over the Arctic Circle. Together, U.S. and Canadian Defense Forces planned a string of early warning outposts stretching 3,000 miles from Point Barrow, Alaska to Baffin Island. It was called the Distant Early Warning Line, the Dew Line, and it was designed to detect incoming aircraft and alert military planners four to six hours ahead of a Soviet attack. Building the more than 50 Dew Line sites and supporting the 7,500 civilian and military personnel that manned them required massive naval sea lifts. By 1957, the U.S. Navy's Military Sea Transportation Service, MSTS, the forerunner of today's Military Sea Lift Command, had delivered more than 2.5 million tons of cargo and 12 million barrels of fuel to the Canadian Arctic by entering the passage from the west through Point Barrow. But in uh, 1956, the hazards to these ships became uh, abundantly clear. The Navy had a resupply fleet, they got trapped. Uh, and they had no way to break out to the east. There were no accurate charts. Uh, and there was only one way they could get through this passage, and that was uh, to find a way to get out to the east, to map it, and to put down aids to navigation. So the Navy turned to the Coast Guard to do this for them. The Coast Guard was no stranger to Arctic waters. In 1867, when Alaska was purchased, a revenue cutter first visited the vast new territory. Soon, these same ships were being called on for search and rescue missions and law enforcement, and became the core of what would be known as the Bering Sea Patrol. Over the decades that followed, the cutters and crews of the Bering Sea Patrol saved countless lives, ensuring navigational safety and bringing food, medicine, and basic services to isolated settlers and native villages. And so, in the spring of 1957, with winter still raging in the Northwest Territories, 2,100 miles to the south, a Coast Guard cutter, Spar, was being readied for an Arctic mission. Spar would not be alone on its journey. Two other Coast Guard vessels would accompany it. One was the buoy tender Bramble, a long-range tender designed with ice-breaking capabilities, a heavy lift crane, and open deck space for servicing aids to navigation. After wartime service in California, Alaska, the Aleutian Islands, and Hawaii. Bramble had sailed to Bikini Island in 1947 to participate in the first tests of the effect of an atomic bomb on surface ships. In 1957, Bramble's home port was Miami, Florida, but the vessel was being readied for a totally different kind of climate. Both Bramble and Spar had a lot of newcomers on their crews. One was a young damage controlman named Ron Kubek, Kubek had enlisted in the Coast Guard in 1955 and was serving aboard another vessel when he heard the call for volunteers for a mission to the Arctic. He jumped at the opportunity and soon found himself aboard Spar, a damage controlman on the expedition and among an almost entirely new crew made up of other volunteers. Bramble's skipper, Lieutenant Commander Harry H. Carter, faced a double challenge. Not only was he commanding a new crew, he was a newcomer himself, having taken command while Bramble was still being fitted out. On top of that, he had no previous experience aboard buoy tenders. But he did have experience with ice and with the sciences that were critical to the mission. He had served on convoy escort duty in the North Atlantic during the war. And after the war, he had specialized in oceanography, meteorology, and geophysics and served on international ice patrol cruises and on Coast Guard oceanographic missions off Newfoundland. Lieutenant Charles Cowing, who commanded SPAR, had a different and equally valuable set of skills. 
He was someone you definitely wanted around in an emergency. Cowing had come up through the ranks, enlisting in 1936 as surfman bosun's mate. After the war, he served in Belgium, supervising the handling and stowage of explosives. In 1950, he earned a commendation for supervising the rescue of 179 survivors when the USNS Benevolence collided with the SS Mary Luckenbach, four miles off the coast of San Francisco. He also was familiar with ice, having served two tours in Alaska. The Northwest Passage mission called for a west to east transit. So the first objective was to reach Alaska. On May 19, 1957, Spar sailed southward out of Narragansett Bay. Bramble left Miami on May 26th and the two cutters rendezvoused in the Panama Canal Zone for the 48-mile passage to the Pacific Ocean. They then put in at Long Beach, California to refuel. Here, Spar took aboard an LCVP, a small landing craft of the type that carried troops and vehicles ashore in amphibious operations during World War II. The plywood craft would soon prove just as valuable for inshore surveying. Spar and Bramble reached Seattle on the morning of June 27th and moored alongside the third Coast Guard vessel assigned to the mission, Storis. In Danish, Storis means great ice, and the pocket icebreaker had already lived up to its name. Built early in World War II, Storis first guided wartime convoys between Newfoundland and Greenland and patrolled the Greenland coast searching for German weather stations. The seaplane it carried on its deck vastly extended its search range. After the war, Storis was transferred to Alaska to serve on the Bering Sea Patrol and supply lighthouses at long-range navigation system stations scattered throughout the region. With its unique ice capabilities, Storis joined the Navy's Dewline resupply operations in 1955. And in 1956, together with the Navy minesweeper USS Requisite, began the first hydrographic surveys of the central Canadian Arctic. It was that mission that Storis, Spar, and Bramble were about to build on. Their objective, find, chart, and mark with navigational aids, a deep water route through the Northwest Passage. Overall command of the three vessels was assigned to Storis' skipper, Captain Harold L. Wood. A Coast Guard Academy graduate commissioned as an ensign in 1936, Wood assisted the chief inspector during Storis's construction in the early 1940s. When Storis entered service on the Greenland Patrol, Wood was its engineering officer. After a wartime tour aboard an attack cargo ship in the Pacific and post-war assignments to cutters operating out of Boston and Seattle, Wood returned to Storis in 1955 as the vessel assumed its role in the Navy's dew line operations. Newly assigned to Storis for the Northwest Passage mission was a young ensign named Richard Rybacki, who would retire from the Coast Guard as Rear Admiral Rybacki. He remembers Captain Wood as a seasoned seaman and superior commanding officer, somewhat stoic and rarely without his pipe. He also remembers the captain's wry sense of humor. The three Coast Guard vessels were attached to the MSTS task force under the command of Navy Rear Admiral Henry Persons. And Ensign Rybacki was there when the Coast Guard officers first met the Admiral. You have to remember in those days that people would refer to the Coast Guard very often as the hooligan Navy, kind of a rough and ready term that was a term of endearment when used inside the service, but could be thought of as a slur or a, very much of an insult coming from someone outside the service. And so these men came into the meeting and the Navy Admiral said, well, it's really good to have the hooligan Navy here. And I, I can just see Captain Wood, as Admiral Ryback, he said, he took his pipe out of his mouth and said, well, Admiral, sir, we, we don't mind you calling us hooligans, but it's really the Navy part that we find objectionable. Before leaving Seattle, Storis was outputted with a landing platform that would allow Navy helicopters to operate from the deck. And a Navy hydrographer reported aboard Spar to assist with the mapping and surveying. Then the convoy of what Newsweek magazine called three stubby ships with their 200